Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Tracy Cook, and I'm the online media manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Digital Design, Thinking Behind Requirements Engineering. Today's featured speaker is Kim Larenroth. Kim is the first chair of the International Requirements Engineering Board, IREB, and chief requirements engineer at Odessa AG. Today's webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. Please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the GoToWebinar control panel. You can also download handouts from today's sessions in the handout section of the control panel. And now I'd like to say thank you to IREB for training for sponsoring today's event. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Stefan Sturm to say a few words before we get started. Stefan? Yeah, hi Tracy, thank you. Hi everybody, this is Stefan Sturm. I'm the Managing Director of the International Requirements Engineering Board. I'll just give you a few words on the IREP. So IREP is the provider of the Certified Professional for Requirements Engineering Education Scheme. We have performed over 60,000 certifications worldwide and about 50,000 of these people have succeeded in the foundation level. Um, you will find more information on the IREP in the handout, which you can find in the download section of the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, we do have as well an online magazine, which I want to mention, uh, the RE magazine. It's free online. You can uh, check out the articles there. You will find as well information on that in the RE Mac handout. Um, Recently, we came across uh, the, the fact that uh, today we need more design focus when uh, doing kind of requirements engineering. Uh, still, the CPRE is very important for more technical systems, but when you do uh, really uh, hip and, um, and uh, nice and uh, new tools and, and software, you need to have more design focus. And therefore, we will launch in 2020. Give one a click for me. Yes, thanks. Um, the Digital Design Professional Certification Scheme, it's new, will be launched in 2020. And Kim Launroth will give you more um, info on that now. Kim, the stage is yours. Stefan, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I want to give you an introduction to digital design and the idea behind it. And to, to start with it, I want to start with a kind of historical overview of software or IT business. I think we, we do software from the 1950s or so, and there is there is a something that, that is not really recognized by people working in the business for a long time, namely that we, we have a kind of paradigm shift. Normally, or in the, in the time before the year 2000, we typically had the situation that our customers or stakeholders had certain expectations on our software and the technology people had to deal with this expectation, develop software according to it. One important event there was the dot-com crash in the 2000s where, where the expectations of people go to the sky and technology was not able to fulfill it. And somewhere between 2000 and 2010, something quite interesting happened that we got new technical possibilities. For me, the invention or the presentation of the first iPhone was a kind of turning point because until this, we had poor internet and with the iPhone, we had mobile and usable smartphones that made the internet and uh, mobile communication available to almost everybody. And in, in addition, we have many inventions made then, 3D printing, 5G internet, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and so on, which somehow turned the situation because now we have technical possibilities that our stakeholders or customers were not even aware, <coughs> were not even aware of in my in my business. This is typically reflected by a customer or stakeholder saying, make it like Google, make it like Apple, make it easy, make it innovative. And this it's typically it's very difficult for our customers to explain what they want and it's quite unclear where their expectations are going and when you look at our methods on for example requirements engineering was invented or born somewhere in 1977 usability engineering was invented somewhere in 1993 
on 2001, we had the Agile Manifesto or the Babok first draft was presented in 2005. All our methods somehow were developed or created before this kind of magical moment where our technical possibilities evolved so much. And this is really an issue when we want to develop innovative systems using this technology because our customers really face a challenge formulating requirements, their ideas on how to use these technologies to develop innovative products or services. And the main issue from my point of view is that all our methods use scientific analysis as a kind of leading principle. We assume that there is a world out there here, the skyline, and you use certain tools to look at it, to analyze it properly and to find the requirements, the ideas that our stakeholders want us to develop or to create. In the 1960s, a similar development took place in the product business. People were doing research on design and this for me here is a very important quote from a design researcher from 1966. He said that the scientific method is a pattern of problem solving behavior employed in finding out the nature of what exists, whereas the design method is a pattern of behavior employed in inventing things of value which do not yet exist. And the important thing here is which do not yet exist. He finally says that science is analytic and design is constructive, which means that designers from this point of view were especially trained to develop things that do not yet exist. When you compare this to the situation where where we use scientific analysis as a guiding principle, we always assume that something is out there which we simply have to understand to create the system. And designers are especially trained to do not deal with this situation, to invent a kind of new future. This is also something designers very often say they think about the future, how things should be. And here are some examples of industrial design products, lamps, the Mac, the Mac, the iMac keyboards and so on. And a very important characteristic of industrial design is that it's separated from manufacturing, the, the, the creative act of determining and defining a product and producing it afterwards. When you look at the, the lamp, for example, it's a mass production process where you design the lamp, the form, the function, and then pr produce it as a kind of factory. And they further say that industrial design is separated from craft-based design where the maker creates the form during the building process. And when you use this kind of quote in the IT or in the software business, we very often do a kind of craft-based design. To understand the difference a bit better here is a typical situation in industrial design, people sitting at the desk and talking about a product, about a design. And on the right hand side, the stakeholder says something about its need. I need ABC, I need a kind of coffee machine. And then the industrial designer here starts thinking about how the product does look like. Here is a picture of a coffee machine. And in addition, we also have a, an engineer and he, sorry, he asked the question, how does this look like? He creates a draft of the idea, talks to the stakeholder, iterates about this idea and in, uh, in the meantime, the technician thinks about technical components, how to realize this coffee machine. And this is the typical way industrial designers work. They present a draft of their idea. They try to imagine the product that they want to develop. And if you transfer the same situation to a typical IT business, you have the same people sitting there, maybe even drawing the same pictures. and the stakeholder has the coffee machine idea in mind or at least we assume that our stakeholders have the idea in mind and we have to employ certain elicitation techniques interviews and so on to understand what the stakeholder really wants and again the stakeholder says i need abc and then my now requirements engineer or business analyst thinks who she needs abc what should i ask to understand this a bit better and then what about X, Y, Z? He starts to ask a question. And at the same time, again, the technician starts to think about the possible realization. And the very important thing or the very important difference between a design oriented person and a analysis oriented person is that the designer assumes 
or the designer has the idea in his head and asks question to improve this picture instead of assuming to ask the stakeholder to explain it. And when we when we use this kind of working, I typically use this picture to explain what we are doing. We separate the world typically in a kind of environment or context. We create specifications or concepts to describe what we want to build. And then we use software and other technologies to realize what we want to do. And when you look at the business analysis or interaction design or requirements engineering, usability engineering and so on, they all they typically deal with the environment, want to understand what's there and create concepts that allow other people to develop concepts that realize these things. And then you complement the picture with, for example, software architecture, software designers, software engineers, programmers, DevOps, and so on. And this is the typical way we shape our style of working with uh, in the software IT business. We create concepts or we have certain roles and professions that create concepts and other roles and professions use these concepts to develop and create technology. This is a typical role model that's working very well in the, let me say, analytical style way of creating products. When you go back to industrial design and simply say, oh, we can simply transform the ideas from industrial design to software business, this is quite difficult. As I said, industrial design assumes that there is a kind of upfront design process where somebody creates the prototype of a product, creates the idea. This idea then is handed over to mass production and many identical products are created. Sometimes you get feedback from the market or from the factory and the designs improve. But we know from the 2000s, from the um, presentation of the Agile Manifesto, this, this kind of complete upfront specification approach does not really work for software. And this is a typical misunderstanding when you talk to people from industrial design and say, hey, simply use our approaches in software business and everything will be fine. In the software business, we know that we have a kind of requirements or understanding process that works iteratively with the development process. And somehow at the end, you create working software. To, to really benefit from, from what industrial designers do, you have to go several steps back in history because the, the, main, the main idea in industrial design was that, that there are people that are trained in a way that they can design products that really work. This goes back to the Bauhaus movement, which was an art school in Germany. And um, the, the founder of the school said that he needs to train people so that they understand the whole process, how chairs, lamps, houses, and so on are made so that they can design according to the capabilities and limits of their material and create products that really use that power or the abilities of the material at hand. The importance here, this, this art school was founded in 1919 and at this time, many new materials were invented. They learned to use metal for creating chairs. They learned to use glass for forming lamps. And this was a very, very important step in the development of industrial design that they understood that they had to teach people in design and in the material or in the technology so that they can really use the full potential of the material. So when you go back to the picture I showed to describe the roles that we currently have. I can use this slide to simply show you how we believe digital design as a profession must be shaped. Namely in the sense that it covers the all three levels. That means the digital design professional must understand the environment, the context, must understand what we want to build as a type of product. He must be able to create concepts on all levels, on a conceptual and on a technical level to, to understand what technology people can build. And when you look at the free part of the slide, there is something that is, is also important, what we call digital engineering, which complements the digital designer, a, a technical role, a technical profession that is able to develop and construct digital product, um, products in the same way a digital designer can design them. And the importance here is that 
these professions are not defined according to the levels we see here, environment, concept and technology, but cross-cut all these three levels so that in the sense of the Bauhaus idea that designers must understand technology and its capability, here the digital designer must understand the context, the concept and the technology to design digital solutions that really use the capabilities of the technology. And that is from my point of view the real difference here that we need to educate people that want to understand technology and want to work in a deep interrelationship with technical people to develop these solutions because this is the main difference when you compare physical products with digital or software products. When you look at the definition of what we call a digital design professional, we have four important points. The first thing is that a digital design professional understands digital as a shapeable material. This is a very, very strange sentence at first view because people always say, wow, digital, this is something with one and zero. Why is this a kind of material? I will come to this in a moment why this is important. The second thing is that he thinks through capabilities and potentials of technology in combination with economic constraints and demands and needs of people. This is where requirements, technology and business comes together. Then leading the building process of a solution is a very important thing because the difference between a mass product and a digital product is the complex and long-term development process. And as a digital design professional, I must understand how this process works and I must be able to work in all phases during realization to really take care of the design of my product. And finally, from our point of view, the digital design professional is really responsible for this design of the solution in all aspects of the process and the product. I want to start with the idea of shapeable material. It is the first thing that we, we, we you need to understand is we, we typically get the question, why do you talk about digital design and not about software design? When you look at software, people very often see this kind of picture. You see a screen, a user interface with apps or with applications, with the office products and so on. And this is the way technical people look at software. When what we mean with digital is that we take the whole person and the whole environment into account. Here, this picture could be a woman posting a picture on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and posting it because she wants to talk to her friends and say, hey, I am at a nice party or at a nice event. Look what how great this is. And the idea here is not the technical act of presenting the picture, but the idea that the, the user can connect, for example, here to the network, to the Twitter or Instagram network to share a moment with the people. The technology goes into the background. It's an important enabler, but it's not, it's part of the product. It's not the product at all. And this is the, the, the reason why we said, hey, we, we believe that digital is, is something that can be shaped independently from the technology. And this is a screenshot of my desktop when I prepared the slides for this webinar. You see a mind map, you see iTunes in the background. If you look closely, you can see I listen to Mark Knopfler there to relax a bit. You can see a dictionary, you can see various slide decks where I copy my slides from. And this is for me a very important part of digital. It's the visible surface. It's everything you can see, you can imagine. And the digital design professional will be trained to understand this visual surface with a three three type concept which we call form function and quality the perceivable form of digital is the user interface the relationship between the device and the user the function is that what the digital actually does for me for example here at an online shop the website recommends additional products for me and you have also perceivable qualities the speed the aesthetics of the user interface, the way the colors, the, the, the user interface is shaped. And this, this view on digital is only, let me say, half of the story because the important power of software and digital technology is that there is something below it that the typical user cannot see. But you have to understand this type of 
this this part of the technology to really be able to shape digital solutions. We call this the underlying form function and quality. Underlying form, for example, is the microservice architecture that today many many great uh, startups use to shape their business. Or when you talk about single page applications, for example, the Google Mail website, this is an underlying form where you say, my digital solution uses these types of patterns to create the digital product I want to offer. And the underlying function, of course, is a lot of the things that the software do. For example, artificial intelligence here or um, encryption algorithms, deep learning algorithms to, to really train the software to do something with AI tech. This is underlying function and the underlying quality is, for example, the scalability of the solution. That you say, Ooh, I do not know how many users I will have. I need a solution that can scale up with my business. For example, during Christmas time, my online shop has several users, several more users than in the typical day. And so I, I need to shape the solution in a kind of structure that allows me to scale if I need the additional performance. And the, the important lesson for me from my 20 years of being in the software business is that I can only shape digital solutions, innovative digital solutions, when I at least have a certain understanding of this technology. And this is something that we really want to embed into the digital design professional that he or she is open for understanding technology. It's very clear that the digital design professional will not be able to program digital solutions like a professional software engineer. But from my point of view, this is not really important because the, the digital design professional must understand, again, the, the capabilities of the technology, the material, and not so much the capability, the, the, the programming behind it. For example, when you create a user interface for a website, it really makes a difference if you use typical HTML technology with JavaScript, or if you use frameworks like Angular JavaScript, which gives you much more capabilities of designing and a website much more functionality compared to a standard html and this is only a very simple example when you look for example at artificial intelligence which is a very important technical trend today for creating innovative solutions people from ai typically talk about learning data and uh, learning algorithms deep learning uh, layered learning and so on but when I design a, a digital solution, a product with artificial intelligence, this technology is, of course, important for me. But more important is are the special properties of artificial intelligence, which is typically not considered during the design of a digital solution, namely that the solution must learn. If you, for example, use an iPhone, some 10 years ago, people were laughing about the poor capabilities of Siri for understanding messages and controlling the iPhone. Today, this is almost gone. The Siri or other voice assistants work perfectly because the, the companies manage to integrate the learning process into the usage of the product. And a very, very simple example of this can be found on many online shops. Online shops typically use artificial intelligence to create recommendations, for example, for a product. And here you see one button, which is called helpful, and people are motivated to click on this button if they find this recommendation helpful. And what here really takes place is a learning data point for the artificial intelligence. And this is what I mean when I talk about designing solutions with the capabilities or limits of a technology. You think about how to integrate the special properties and capabilities of the technology into the product so that you can really use what the product or what the technology can do for you. The next step is the thinking through of capability, technology, business, and people. And here the common picture is this business people technology triangle, which we all know from design thinking. And there are many ways of working with this picture. A typical business driven mode looks like this. Someone says, hey, there is a business relevant need or requirement from people. And then I talk to my technical people and they say, can I build a system that realizes this business case? And then hopefully a business case, a technology is created that people will accept. 
that means you move to the center of the picture because the innovation or the really innovative products are created at the sweet spot between all these three things. The next way of working is the tech-driven mode. You say, oh, there's a cool technology, maybe artificial intelligence. And the next is then we find people and the people's need that can be satisfied with this new technology and hopefully we'll get a business case out of it. I think we saw many, many examples of this way of doing business. And the third one is the people-driven mode. Somebody sees an unsatisfied need and then people start thinking about the technology to solve this need. And finally, we hope this system creates a business case. And all three modes are really valuable in and are proper ways of working of, of creating digital solutions. And for me, the really important message is that we want to teach the digital design professional that he values all three ways of working and considers the situation at hand and selects a proper way of working so that he can quickly go to the center of this figure to create a solution that is a business case that satisfies people's need and uses technology that can realize this solution. The third thing is leading the building process and here we really come to the to the difference between physical products and digital products just as a very simplified picture we use this three four idealized activities to define what we what the building process is we start with design where we say that it's about understanding the needs and shaping a conceptual solution that fulfills the needs the next activity is construction we create a technical structure of the digital solution defining programming languages technical infrastructure and so on and we finally realize this and re realization we call it and we implement and roll out this digital solution in the center here is the management which is responsible for governing the process with this four idealized activities the the it's, it's not so much about the four bullets here it's about the interrelationship which we want to teach the digital design professional because if he or she wants to lead a design process or a, a building uh, the development process of a digital solution from his perspective he must understand how all these perspectives works together the first thing here is the management point of view it's about defining the building process this is something from my perspective very often goes wrong in, in large projects people do not are not able to define a proper development process they simply take something out of the bookshelf for example a scrum or a v model or waterfall style process model and simply use it instead of thinking about their special situation Another thing is the strategic direction of the product development or the implementation sequence, what is implemented first. And finally, another important thing that always is not properly considered from my point of view is the effort estimation, which means that typically technicians are doing the estimation how much a product development might cost or designers do it. And this is something that people must do together. The next thing here is the interrelation between design and construction. The digital designer should be trained to talk about fundamental technical decisions, for example, with software architects, because this is very important to get an understanding of the freedom of design that the designer has. A very simple example here again is the user interface technology. If I use a decree, um, if my, my, my device is a smartphone, I have a completely different way of working than compared to a laptop, for example. The next thing here is the relationship between design and realization. Here are all details of the perceivable form, function, and quality. For example, in a development process, the design people must talk to the development people and explain how the user interface looks like. And finally, to complete the picture, the digital designer must at least understand that the construction and realization people talk to each other about the underlying form, function, and quality, and does quality assurance here of technical um, concepts. Finally, responsibility is a, for me a very important issue. 
and to to really define what we mean by responsibility we we defined 10 principles of good digital design which really makes clear what we understand as a good digital solution the first one is about usability good digital solutions are useful and usable they are elegant and aesthetic the third one is about being able to evolve, which means that a good digital solution is designed and built in a way that it can change according to changing stakeholder or market needs. Here for me, the Amazon web shop is a great example. When you look at the design in the 1990s, it's quite different from how the shop today looks like and what kind of functionalities it now has. And this ability to evolve is closely related to the underlying technology that the people use. The next thing is about exploratory, being exploratory, which means, for example, A-B testing. A good digital solution can offer certain functions and allows the user, or allows the, 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 the provider of the solution to experiment with various types of solutions or functions and selects the functions that the users really accept and develop them further. The next one is about focusing on the person, focusing on the effects of what a solution will do to society, to the environment, which is closely related to uh, the sixth statement, which is about anticipating what the solution will do or will create. The seventh one is from my point of view, very important data protection and privacy is really an issue in today's digital work. And we want to teach digital design professionals that uh, security and uh, data protection begins with a design process, which for example means when you design a solution, you will talk a lot about the data that you store, um, payment data or address data or something else. And if you start to design a solution, you should think about the information that you want to store and think about do you really need this type of data? And for example, if your system contains payment data, you automatically are attractive to hackers so that and they want to break into your system to steal this data. And for example, if you are able to develop an online shop that is not does not need to store payment data because you use payment services that are connected via an external website, your digital product is much safer. The eighth thing is about sustainability. Digital solutions consume a lot of energy today. And this is also something that can start in the design that you design low power devices, design algorithms that do not consume that much energy. Here, for example, artificial intelligence is a good example. Artificial intelligence consumes a lot of computation power and consumes a lot of energy. And the ninth and 10th statement finally is about using digital technology only really where it's necessary and do not create solutions that are not really used, the, 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 does not provide benefit and can be replaced by an analog solution. To summarize this, we, we want to create a, or we, will, we are currently developing an education scheme, Stefan already mentioned it, we call it the digital design professional and currently we are working on the foundation level, the entry level, exam. It's designed as a three-day course where we teach the most important ideas of digital design to the participants. It consists of currently five chapters. It includes a detailed motivation for the necessity of digital design because we believe that you have to explain why you need a new profession and what the paradigm shift towards digital design really means. It teaches several essential basics including methods and techniques. Here the idea is that we want to give beginners hands-on tools that they can start designing their own digital solutions. In a three-day course, of course, you cannot provide comprehensive techniques and make people a holistic designer. Be becoming, for example, an industrial designer is a bachelor and master program at the university. So a three-day course really can teach you the basics. But here we really focus on practical techniques that, for at least from our experience, work and provides a starting point. And so that in the end, the participants can really get a broad overview of what a digital designer can do, what his competence spectrum is about, so that everybody that 
takes the training, can access his own competencies and decide what to do, how to proceed. I will give you an example in a second. Here is the chapter structure of the first thing, chapter, which deals with the introduction. We give a definition, we talk about digital as material, the relationship between digital and product design, which is important for understanding what the differences are. And now we come to the practical part. We talk about digital design and the building process, which is very important for, for getting in contact with technology people. The, the second part of this chapter deals with conceptual work. There we go really into detail and provide an introduction to create very simple concepts that on the other side are compatible with technical people, that technical people can understand and can use to develop solutions. The next thing is about prototyping, which I think is a common tool also in business analysis requirements engineering, but here we go one step further and say, describe how prototyping can also be used to as a thinking tool to shape solutions and not only as a kind of validation tool. The third chapter deals with digital as material, the same structure that I already introduced. We spend some time on introducing people to technology, talk about perceivable and underlying technology, the way I presented it on the slide. We talk a lot about quality and technology because most quality characteristics of a digital solution heavily rely on the technology that is used. For example, the iPhone is a really great smartphone because the, the technology, the material that the people use, the processor, the software, the design of everything works so closely together. And finally, we present several technology-oriented knowledge areas. Just to give you an example, we talk about the study of algorithms that may seem a bit bit unrelated to digital design, but we believe understanding how algorithms, for example, searching or sorting or other algorithms really work is a good way to study the capabilities of software and digital technology. The fourth section deals with cross-cutting competences. Here we introduce both business models for digital solutions, which are a very important part that a digital designer must understand to not only talk to technical people, but also to understand the business side. We talk about human factors to understand how human perceive digital technologies and tools. And finally, we talk about people management, which we consider an important aspect so that the digital designer understands how people in the project relate and work to each other. Finally, the 10 principles of good digital design. And we also give a kind of summary of the education program at the end to show the people how all the techniques, methods and details we presented in the curriculum support the digital designer in achieving a good digital design. Another beside the syllabus and the, the bigger document and the content description, a very important part of our three-day training material is a comprehensive example. We called it YPRC, your personal running coach. It's a, an app that supports beginners or that wants to support beginners in long distance running. It consists of a watch that you can buy for measuring your health data. It provides a smartphone application that shows you additional services. For example, the map of your, your running course. It provides artificial intelligence services that provides you coaching and training tips. And finally, it contains a remote coaching uh, co coaching service with using a remote voice connection where you run with your smartphone and a headset and a coach somewhere in an office watches your training course, your health data, and gives you immediate feedback tips on how your training is performing. The example consists of a kind of technical diagram to show you the structure which is presented here. It's the watch that the runner uses to interact to measure the heart rate and to the watch has a vibration alert to inform the runner about certain info details of his training. It has the app. The app is running on a smartphone which the runner is assumed to own. Then the app talks to the watch via Bluetooth. 
then the app uses an internet connection to a map server to provide the map data. Furthermore, the app is connected via an internet connection to a coaching portal, with, and the app is further connected to a payment provider to buy AI or personal coaching services. And for the coaching services, the portal is use the, the runner's coach uses a computer with a web browser to interact with the runner. And finally, the runner needs a kind of headset so that the runner can talk to the coach via the internet connection. This is not really a pretty picture of the digital solution, but I hope it gives you an overview how the, the solution is structured and all these building blocks must be described on a certain abstraction level to define the conceptual structure of the solution. Here you see many interactions, you assume that certain devices exist, you will need internet connection in services and so on and this is the, the constructive way of thinking that we believe a digital designer should work in. He should have a picture of the solution in his mind and he should use concepts to document this ideas and to describe the solution that he has envisioned so that technical people can realize it. Here you see a kind of screenshot of the whole document, the, this, the digital design concept behind the digital solution. Somewhere in the background you can see the smaller way, this is the picture I already showed is part of the document and it's a somehow 80, picture, 80 pages lot big a Word document that we provide as a Word file so that you can use it for your own projects and to work with it. Here is a screenshot of one use case that we presented with in the in the case study. The runner is registering at the at the, the app. We see a welcome screen. We see a kind of six seven step sequence and. We provide exercises for self-study. We are, we, we believe that it's not really a good idea to work through an 80-page document in a three-day course. But the, the the idea of this case study is that the participants can use this document as a kind of living training material and work on their own documentation capabilities. Another thing is that we provide a lot of explanations in the document why certain parts of the use case are written in this or that way. For example, here in step seven at the end, the user is directly um, locked in when he entered his data and is sent to the start screen. This is a kind of convenience feature that must not be defined this way. And the other thing is here in step three in the middle, we do not mention concrete data. This is typically very difficult for beginners to understand in defining use cases that they can provide a certain type of information at another part of the concept. And here is a very simple screenshot of the app, a mock-up of the user interface, and you can see all the data that the user wants to enter. The next thing is here, as I already showed, we provide realistic examples of user interfaces. For example, here with traceability information to data storage, pragmatic mock-ups, all mock-ups are created with PowerPoint. This is at least for me very important to create a very low barrier for using all the things that we that we have. Here you see screenshots of the PowerPoint files, of the Word files, and we also provide a lot of detailed explanation how the Word document works. For example, all the traceability information here is created with work bookmarks that can be used to create navigatable hyperlinks when you create, for example, a PDF or something out of the document that readers can follow all the traceability information. So to sum up my talk, which I, I wrote it on the slide because people so often misunderstand the idea of digital design. We do not want to define a new role. We really have enough roles in the IT business. What we want to create with a digital design professional is a, an education that is able to build bridges between existing roles and shows a direction in what we believe is important for developing innovative digital solutions that really can use all the capabilities of technology that we currently have. 
and roles, at least from my understanding, are then defined on the really uh, on the project circumstances at hand. This is much more important than defining, creating predefined roles that people want to use. And just to, to make it clear, digital design will not replace business analysis, requirements engineering, or usability engineers. I really believe that this education can complement the capabilities that these people or people trained in business analysis and so on already have, so that they extend their skill set with the ability to shape digital solutions with innovative technologies. And what you can use here is the the this picture I already shown here you see currently I believe that all the roles existing roles professions work on this level and when you put on the digital design triangle you see that you get additional skills that go into the technology that already that complements your already existing specification requirements engineering and business analysis skills so that you can really work together with technical people on a new level on a new way of working and that was my talk i think stefan will provide some closing words before the question session yes kim uh, thanks a lot for the talk um yeah um as i mentioned the digital design professional educational scheme will be available uh, next year um very likely before summer and um, if you want to uh, be informed about news on that, please go to digitaldesign.org, register to the newsletter. You will then receive information once the syllabus is out, once the um, companion uh, documents are out. Again, thanks for attending. Um, and now we will have a QA. and a um, I will hand over to Tracy to moderate the Q&A. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefan. And thank you, Kim, for such a great session today. Uh, for those, a quick reminder, if you have any questions, to type your questions into the questions box. And Kim, we do have a few, so I'm going to start reading them out loud. Is it possible to get an exact release date of the DDP in Germany? No, not really. <laughs> we, are, we are working in a kind of agile process and we believe it will be published somewhere between the first and the second quarter in Germany. Thank you. Our next question, Inter interaction designers already think in this way, and sorry, this is a little of a comment as well, toss in some brainstorm workshops and innovation patterns and you will get even more. So what would a digital designer add to this? The, the, the point with, with, at least from my experience with interaction designers, is that they are really great at designing user interfaces, creating a great experience interaction between the software and the user. But when it comes to the more, let me say, underlying technology aspects, for example, artificial intelligence or another, another buzzword here in this context is blockchain, I experienced that digital uh, interaction designers have some issues with working into the technical details of these solutions so that uh, technology so that they can really really use the benefits of this technology and this is at least in the difference and the, the other thing at least from my experience is that the, the interaction designers really really focus deeply on the relationship between the solution and the user which is really a great and important competence but if you step one go go one step further and look for example as you at uber as a kind of digital solution as an as an example you have a much larger type of system that is not only related to the app the relationship between the the app and the user but it's more about the ecosystem and here i also experience that the digital design point of view greatly complements the way interaction designers work Thank you, Kim. Our next question. In your opinion, do requirement engineers need or should improve a set of hard skills like AI, RPA, etc., so that you could have a wider vision on suggestions or options? Yes, definitely. It, it really depends on, on the type of business that people are working in, but in my, in my practical experience, almost every every business now is talking about the capabilities of artificial intelligence and I, I really found it helpful to have 
a artificial intelligence um, lectures during my master program so that I was able to really design and create artificial intelligence solutions myself even at least at a at a at a very simple level and as I said, it's it's really important to 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 grasp the limits and the special needs of the technology to embed it into the products or solutions that people are working. And so, yes, definitely learn something about AI. Thank you, Kim. What is your opinion on the difference between a digital designer and a UX designer or a service designer? Yeah, that's quite an interesting question because the the UX designers are already out there for quite a while. But again, the same the same with the with the interaction designer. I typically miss the the technology technological point of view, not only in terms of understanding what technology can do, but also in terms of how the solution is developed. I very often see usability designers or engineers get frustrated during the long-term development process because it really takes a while from designing the interfaces, designing the experience through the whole development process and until the solution is really shipped. And I, I, I just to, I very often experience that they, these people feel useless during the process because they cannot provide that much input. And uh, again, here getting teached in a way that they can work more closely with technical people is really a benefit. And the second part of the question is the service designer, at least from my understanding, the service design movement emerged from the industrial or product design direction. And again, the, 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 the service design is a very important perspective if you create certain types of solutions like Uber, or let me say Airbnb is a good example where you really have a complex service that the solution offers. And for me, service designers and digital designers are good partners when it comes to creating solutions that have these kind of properties. Thank you, Kim. Okay, our next question. Where will the location of the course be? Hopefully all over the world. <laughs> At okay. least we are looking for training providers all over the world. And if you're interested in offering a training, contact Stefan and we will find a way to get you the material. Perhaps, perhaps I can comment on that. Sorry for jumping in. This is Stefan. So uh, the, the model will be the same as for our IREP certification. Uh, we will have training providers, partners who provide the training all over the globe. There will very likely pretty soon be online trainings as well. So it's uh, very likely that you will find uh, uh, training um, possibilities all over the globe. And there will be a comprehensive handbook for self-study as, as Kim uh, showed you this um, this study. Um, 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 help me out, I'm, I'm, I'm lost now. Study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the so this will all yeah. be available. So there will be available uh, possibility of self-study, but because it's a new topic, training would be, of course, uh, a good thing, and we will be uh, already working on that to get partners on board for the training. Thank you, Stefan and Kim. Our next question: the foundation level is clear, and what are the topics that are covered with advanced modules? Are you able to give some examples? Yeah, sure, sure. There are, we have many, many ideas for advanced, advanced level modules. The, the most obvious one deals with, with concept development, with prototyping. What's also important from our point of view is the part of people management, which is only covered really on two or three pages in the current syllabus. But just to, 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 to emphasize the importance here, I see many solutions and projects failing because people are not able to work with each other in a proper way. I do not mean the team that's developing. I mean the overall organization. And if you, for example, a, are an insurance company that wants to create an innovative way of selling solutions or insurance policies, people are, the, the whole organization is working against this idea because it's not, let me say, their natural way of selling products. And therefore we believe it's very, very important that the digital design professional understands not only the product, but also 
the organization he's working in and the just some practical ways of, of, of some practical impacts of this advanced level will be selecting proper communication tools as requirements engineer i'm trained to write specifications and concepts and communicate my ideas with this kind of documents you can use user stories as a lightweight kind of specification but in the advanced level we will provide completely different approaches not only prototypes but what a very important tool is for example a future press release where you get a one page description of a of the five years success event of your solution that not yet really exists the important idea behind this technique is that it's a completely different communication style which is which is not really compatible with technical people but what is very compatible with people that have more in a, a feeling a, an intuitive way of thinking about solution and this is the, the the one very important part of the advanced level training and the other thing is of course design management which is also a very important um, discipline in the industrial design world which deals with how to manage larger design processes larger design organizations thank you Kim our next question what are the recommended minimal set of IREB courses before attending the DT sorry the DDP foundation yeah quite simple zero we, we, we believe that this is a training that is independent from the CPRE they complement each other of course and we are planning to publish documents that shows the relationship between both, but the CPRE is no prerequisite for this DDP foundation level. Thank you. Our next question, which IT role would benefit the most from a digital design methodology? Um, I believe when, when you will work in agile, product owners are good candidates, requirements engineers and business analysts, of course, but also software architects are at least in my point of view a good target group because software architects are trained to to work with technical people think in concepts and they can complement their competence with digital design so that they can work more in a close relationship with the customer thank you kim and then we have a question what would the german wording be for the ddp ddp <laughs> Digital design, yeah, yeah, there will be no difference. Thank you, Kim. And on that, that's all the time that we have for today. We would like to thank Kim for such a great information and presentation today. Sorry, and I we... just saw a question, Tracy. We, oh. will, we, will we provide the slides? I think we will, right? Absolutely. Sorry, on that, yes, the presentation, including the recording, will be posted on the modernanalyst.com website within two business days. So please check there for the PDF of the presentation as well as the recording, and you still have the time to get download the handouts that are in the GoToWebinar control panel as well. And we would also like to thank iRev for sponsoring today's event. And thank you all for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. And I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at the modernanalyst.com website within a few business days. And this concludes today's event. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.